uh, Warner Kruger. We're at his home in Dallas, Texas. Um, he was born on May 15, 1921. Um, my mother, Amy Penland, is doing the camera. Um, his wife, Joan Kruger, is also here, and my grandmother, Yvonne Muirhead, who is a friend from church. Um, he was in the German Navy and served in World War II. So we'll get started. Um, were, were you drafted or did you enlist? Volunteer. You volunteered? When it, was that? Uh, 1938. Okay. And, and you went right in? I was called 1939. Okay. And that's when you went to training? Called me for basic training as a recruit. Mm -hmm. but everybody was in the forces for, for about six to nine months at the time. And then uh, as time went on, grading in 1939, I believe it was September, October, the war broke out with uh, Poland when we invaded Poland. So the training was cut short and we were then detailed for what we wanted to be in the Navy and uh, send away. In my case, I went to a, a school in Flensburg, Northern Germany, which for communications. Okay. And I was trained there till 1940. Uh, I was there at school. And then when I finished the school, I was put in a holding tank, so to speak in reserve right. and then took part in the invasion of Norway. Okay, so this you were in action. You, not in a submarine, this was just basic Navy right. on a ship as a radio operator. Okay. In lower class. And after that the invasion was over, was sent back to Germany and was put on hold there. And then then what was your next assignment after My you were next back assignment to was uh, I remember it was quite an old and, and schooling again, different grades and mm -hmm. advanced. Uh, for what reason, how, or so, I don't know. I just went and did what they do. And then uh, the France was uh, invaded in, in the meantime. And later on, I was in a pool again and assigned to a small tugboat in the, nor in the North Sea or at the, the northern coast of Germany and just in wait for the invasion of England. Okay. And it took weeks and weeks, nothing to do. And you just waited? And we just waited, and did then it was called off. During that time, did you just keep training? or Just, just training, just waiting at the time. Right, we're training, oh yes, uh, maneuvers and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, and equipment, what we had, we had to try out. We had to be in readiness. Right. In times and so I can't quite recall. And, and, uh, then I something rumored again, and that's when I was called up for a special assignment and for training. And today I know now what it was all about. That was the planned invasion of Russia. Uh -huh. See, we were waiting in Poland, but then we went to the states of uh, uh, Lita, I forget what they call it in, in English, uh, Lithuania, uh -huh. and Lettland. There are three states up there at the Baltic Sea before you get to, yes. to Russia. And we, followed the troops along the coast, doing nothing, just keep in touch with home base, but we were a fleet of trucks, so to speak. We called them our ships, but they were trucks, and, mm -hmm. uh, and to, in readiness, and watched our equipment. We had also guards. We didn't have to do the guarding, but we had guards with us. They followed us wherever we went. So it must have been, it was a special assignment. We knew right. that we realized that we were important. Right. But it was, Wait and see, wait and see. Right. Hurry up and wait. That's what it was. Hurry up and wait. Mm -hmm. So did you, you, you didn't invade then, though? We, oh, we were, we were cl close to it. Oh, we could hear the cannons and everything else mm -hmm. and the planes. I mean, we were right behind the front line, see. But after a while, you got used to it. And right. You lived with it. But we, we felt kind of stupid. We want to be on the ship. You know, that's, right. And, but they tell us that you have an assignment. You get used when you get there, see. But... Uh, it didn't work out. Right. And suddenly they called. They they didn't move. They, they didn't withdraw the troops, but they called us back. Right. So and then later I learned it didn't materialize. Back to Germany and for schooling, and I became got a different rank and was trained again. And uh, in 1942, early 42, then 
uh, in the school uh, for certain uh, duties. We, we were trained a little differently and then we were sent for medicals mm -hmm. and then we had an idea what it's going to be and then we knew we had to go okay. to the submarines. But so. we didn't get it there again. We were put on hold in a holding tank till we were called. And, were, and then you were called up to a ship? And in my case, I was a single one. I didn't have to go. I had to go to France to La Police and report there at the Navy base. It was the third U-boat flotilla. And that's what you were assigned there, to? And that's where they were assigned and then met the boat or the crew and the captain. And what was your job on the U-boat? I was a radio operator, radio operator. main radio operator. Mm -hmm. And there were two, we were two. And so then where did you go in the U-boat? At, at the time we didn't go right away. We were <laughs> refitted. That's what it was, really mm -hmm. fitted. And I was acquainted uh, with, the, with the crew and the boat, which was not orderly because the workmen and everything else were mm -hmm. on base until we got out. And at my first assignment went in the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And we had action. Uh -huh. and with it, Americans? Uh, no, convoys. We don't okay. pick them out. Whatever came in sight, it's okay. what, it wasn't like it is in the movies. Right. It was here and there and there's a lot of chasing and because we were chased too. Mm -hmm. But in 42 we had the upper hand, so to speak. It was good picking. And the first uh, patrol I had wasn't very eventful. We had one ship and more or less we were, we were out there in heavy weather. Mm -hmm. Very heavy weather always. And then later on the second assignment I got acquainted to and I thought maybe they'd plans for me, but they didn't. And we went over to the Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. the next one. It was a long trip, about 10, 12 days, 16 days probably, before we just, we had to travel and not be seen. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know the position where we were heading for. So we traveled when we could above water and then if something came, we yeah, died. Go and, down. Mm -hmm. and then all we did is just observed when they put the convoys together or the ships which went out mm -hmm. and reported at night we went out to sea and come back in the in the morning underwater and just listened and watched. It was for about three or four weeks our duty and then they released us and they went out in the Atlantic and then we were assigned to certain convoys. Mm -hmm. Not single but in, in convoys. How long would you be on the U-boat at a time? Uh, the, the journeys were anything from 8 to 16 weeks. We had journeys over 3 months. And 144 days was our longest one. But due that we weren't successful, we didn't meet anything or on our route. And we were still like uh, fit to fight. And we had enough uh, pro, uh, provisions, mm -hmm. torpedoes, ammunition, so we were assigned again. Right. And then we were finally called home. Mm -hmm. Was it tough being on the U-boat for, oh, for that long being period? Being confined, oh yes, being confined. Yeah, it's tough, and especially if you're in the southern waters where it's hot, it gets hot. We had no air condition or anything uh -huh. like that. You just sweat it out. <laughs> yeah, there was sweating, a lot of sweating going on. Yeah. And life on a submarine, let me about that, there's always uh, action. There's one watch on and one watch off. Right. See, four hours on, four hours off, round the clock. And if you're in action, then everybody's on. Right. But routine goes on. Whatever the action finishes, if you're unfortunately on watch, well, you stay on watch. See, <laughs> the other takes your bunk. And that's where it came about having a, a hot bunk. See, you just take over, take something to eat, and then you sleep for four hours if you can. Right. Yeah, life, you had to be compatible, that, that is true, they, 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 the captain or the officers or the, the leaders of the boat, they pick their people, that you get on with the fellows, there's no fights or anything like that, you know, we all have our habits and so on, and you were compatible, and you were proud of it too, and the captain was proud of it, and if you didn't like anybody, then you transferred them as for somebody else, but they try to keep the crew, because mm -hmm. It's, you relied on one another, it's for all ranks down. Right. I, I didn't mind it, uh, it, it got boring, but my job wasn't too boring because we were always in action, because as a radio operator, you knew more than anybody else in the group, more than listening. the captain, you know. We didn't uh, decipher all of the messages, but there was some we had to decipher in order to find out what was meant for us. When a message comes on the outside, it doesn't show. 
-hmm. So, but they're marked somehow that you know it's important. Certain letters they send out, this you have to open up right now. So, and others just, when there was a slow period, then you, we operated the Enigma, you heard about the coding machine. Mm -hmm, and then, right. And, and then and you so deci that deciphered all, we had deciphered all messages and we knew what was for the captain and what wasn't. So right. we just put it aside. Then we had to show them to him, but we just say, well, this is rubbish or, <laughs> or so, yeah. know, it's for somebody else. So right, right. They didn't address any particular boats. They did always, it goes to certain pieces, uh, people or boats in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And you knew, you know, and just, what was for you and what was. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting being an operator. Mm -hmm. We won, every, knew everything, what was going on, and we were important and the responsibilities. Now I know what the schooling was for. Right. And it was like a lawyer today or a doctor. You can't grasp it all. We were frustrated because we couldn't get it, you know. But now you know when you're just two people that know the job and you get out there, something doesn't go right. They are looking at you. You know, we could, couldn't decide from a message. We knew we had and what went wrong, see. And they were lying to you and it's, it's uh, uh, responsibility we had and that's what we were trained for. Yeah. Tell me about when when your boat was hit. Well, it, and I mean like with all these operations we were discharged. I mean it was just one of those things. As time went on the years because the planes came about, the Congress were guarded by planes or aircraft carriers, it got harder in like 43, it's got, well, it got tougher in 43. In 42 or beginning of 43 we still had the upper hand we picked our target, mm -hmm. so to speak, and uh, we even could take pictures with possibilities mm -hmm. then, but this hall was, oh, when we got fresh air, just to get fresh air, some smokers could smoke upstairs, could smoke in the boat, but they mm -hmm. were allowed up, little things like that. It got tougher as it went on, and the patrols got shorter then too, mm -hmm. because it was tougher on the crews. Mm -hmm. You always had to be on guard, and nobody knows to the experience of what it's like to get these death charges. Right. This is something else. Yeah, it makes you shudder. You look up. You know, everybody looks up. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. Is that what caused your boat to... to well, in that case, this particular boat where we... Uh, when we go back to the last boat uh, 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 when we was transferred on the 960 and the captain was Ginter Heinrich, uh, we were just, I was just put on the boat. The, the guy the I replaced was in training for, we had then radar and underwater uh, listening devices mm -hmm. that all changed from each patrol. We had to be trained for that. So, And he was away and he couldn't get back. He was caught in an air raid in, in Hamburg and was hurt. He didn't make it back to base, so they had a replacement. That's where they picked me out the pool and put on there. And I was just going to, or well, we were just going to take the boat from La Police to the northern part where the invasion was planned to reinforce it up there. And then I was supposed to come back. Mm -hmm. But when we were a couple of days out at sea, we could tell where we were going, you know, by, and with the navigator, I talked to him. He said, just resign yourself. You're not going back home. He said, we are heading some other way. Yeah. And then uh, the captain, after three days, he opened the assignment and it says we had to go into the Mediterranean right mm -hmm. through the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. through Gibraltar, which mm -hmm. was a death trap. I mean, you just go through with a, a slew, and they knew you were coming. Mm -hmm. I have books now where well, they knew we were coming. <laughs> <laughs> we go out, <coughs> being undetected till we got to Portugal, and then we had to wait for a convoy to come which was all the intelligence brings all this about, that we get it on messages. And we lay in the sand of Portugal and wait for the right tide, the right moon, and the convoy. And this all is done ashore from, from the command, the upper command, they know that, see? Mm -hmm. And they said, now, the convoy's there and there, and we raise, we wait by listening when they come, and then we go right under there, or we did. I'm telling you what we did, or the boat did. Mm -hmm. Uh, under the convoy, and just time it so when the tide goes right through Gibraltar with the noise, the propeller noise, and on get through. And then, of course, they're faster than we are in the water when they left us, and we went up for fresh air and so on. 
and then we went in there four days or something like when they detected us. Actually, we weren't detected if we we made a boo boo, or whoever up there. We found American destroyers, <coughs> and uh, we were kind of excited. They were setting targets. They didn't know we were there at mm -hmm. the point, and we thought, well, we got ready, action station, and all torpedoes, everything ready. And but the last minute, and when, well. Life on a boat, a how boat functions, you have to know. It's like a bottle, you put it in the, in the water, see, half full, it kind of floats and mm -hmm. so on. But when you do, and you fire a torpedo, at the same time you flood the boat with water to equal the weight, so the boat won't come out, mm -hmm. see. And because in the calculation, today it's all computers do that, but at the time it was to do with slide rules and stuff like that. Uh -huh. And somehow I missed and the boat showed. So the and boat, so we the boat did, came up out uh, of the Not all, but they knew we detected it. And mm -hmm. That was it. And they, these two destroyers, they just scoffed. We said they went, you know. And from then on, we were chased. And it was almost three days, it seems, they chased us by air every time we come up. And uh, we had to come up in order to load the batteries. See, underwater, you don't run the diesels or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to recharge the batteries. So you had to come and up. you had to run the diesels. You had to come up, and we did. And as soon as we come up, and we bought time for outmaneuvering planes and so on. And but when they started dropping bombs or depth charges, we we had to hide, and, mm -hmm. and we hid as long as we could. But there was once they know where well, your position with the planes today, and the stores and the equipment, they pinpoint you where you are. See, and then sooner or later you're going to come out with the radius. They know how fast we can go underwater, see. We, we were hiding pretty good. Uh, I've got a book there where you might read a short story on it. And uh, it took a long time. Mm -hmm. It took a long time. And we finally had to get up. And we were prepared to go up. <laughs> when I think about it. Because depth charges were then and then, because the boat started to leak here and there. Mm -hmm. They couldn't be repaired, they tried their best. And when they finally gave the order, this is it, get ready. Well, we knew what we were drilled for something like that. You practice, take your belongings, and start going up there, because the captain is the first one to go. Or look around when you come up, because you see when the submarine comes up. And they were waiting for us right there. Mm -hmm. He never came down, he was badly hurt. Mm -hmm. And then we are trained. Who goes first with the positions? You train it and we rehearse it even uh, uh, when you don't maneuver. You know, we're just traveling so on, you still have a rehearsal and everything goes like clock. Because you have to go out one hole. Mm -hmm. See, going out. That's the only way through the tower and up to hook and, and who has a turn. People are not needed in the boat, they go first. Not important people that have nothing to do with ranks or anything, it's just the functions of it who have to stay. Yeah, and, and things that go through your mind, if I may say so, the mm -hmm. incidents. Uh, I remember them being on leave at home and I saw these Russian soldiers that were captured. Uh, my hometown was a steel mill, it was the industry there, and they worked there. And they come with their little belongings and they had no shoes, wooden clocks and rags around their feet and so on, in the snow, it was in the winter time. And I thought, I put new clothes on, clean clothes, we had some new shoes. <laughs> put one of them. I was going in style, you know, I didn't <laughs> want to look like that. And little did I know, uh, it, it, it all came about differently. Then we were fired on by air and by the destroyers, mm -hmm. I mean artillery. It was in, while I was waiting my turn to get up there, uh, we had a hit. And I saw a, a hard salami, which we had at times, and the, stuffed them between pipes and all of it, which stuffed the boat when it filled out with uh, supplies. Mm -hmm. A hard salami came flying like a sapling with sparks past me. <laughs> it, this, this I remember, it's funny, that I remember. I don't know who was behind me or who was in front of me, but that sausage I remember. <laughs> no, no kidding, because it was smoke and sparks and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then it moved and it got up the ladder, and then it got stuck, nothing happened. And then they're pushing from below, you know, they're right. anxious, and the boat was gradually going down until it was kind of listing. And 
a body came down without a hit. That was a hold up. He got mm -hmm. shot and let him drop down and then it moved. And then we had another hit and all I remember was sparks and smoke and I found myself in the water. I don't know how I got in the water or what. I do not remember. I cannot remember. There was a blast. We had a direct hit and it was a blast. They got me out. And did you Other people remember they jumped, you know, they, mm -hmm. they remember they jumped and they saw, they, they saw the traces coming from the, you know, the army. But this was it. Did you, did everyone have life preservers? Oh, we had, we had, oh, we got ready, you know, mm -hmm. we got, like I said, dressed and, and the mm -hmm. life preservers and everything else. Yeah, we dressed. <laughs> and you don't blow it up, you know, they, they had different ways of inflating it. See? Some automatic when salt water hits it. If you don't do it, then salt water do it and mm -hmm. inflate it part ways. And the equipment was good and it functioned. Well, it functioned. I know it's safe. And when I came to, uh, it was still fine, you know, but there was no boat. You know, nothing. There was nobody around. Just in the distance, a lot of smoke from the artillery. You know, and then the tracers were going. And it was when plane was flying around too. That's all I saw. And it wasn't, the Mediterranean is not a heavy sea, or did, we didn't experience, the water was fine, but it was all oil and debris and all in my hair and everything else. And I was bleeding too, and I could tell, you know, my eyes and all that. And uh, nobody ran. But the movement of the waves, going every time you go up, crest, you learn a little bit about it, and nobody tells you that, see. <laughs> you take a quick look around, but by looking, you lose directions. See, because you're going back down again, see? Mm -hmm. So wait, and then I thought I seen somebody. I thought I was alone. And the fire didn't stop. And here we go again. Then I thought, well, it must have been in that direction. See, and I still couldn't see the ships, because there was no trace of it. And for smoke and whatever else it was. And maybe it was fog, I don't know, or, or the later steam. But anyway, I did see the somebody. Mm -hmm. And his life was the yellow. And so I tried to make my way to it, but when you got down and again, you kept paddling, and I got up with nothing there. <laughs> but anyway, after quite a while again, I got close enough, I, I saw the head laying in the swimmer just like this, and, and in the life jacket, he, I said, oh, he's dead, and I got close to it, and this was Willie. Mm -hmm. it, oh, I don't know how long it took, you know, paddling, mm -hmm. and, and getting to it. And it's like, I had a little bit in there and, and then life check it. See, the shrapnel had busted it and got hit too, you know. And then what happened really, all the bottles were exhausted, you know, the means to, of keeping them afloat. He started blowing it up. There was one way too, mm -hmm. but it was useless. It was just coming right out. Right. And he blew himself unconscious. You know, you ever had it blowing up balloons right. and you kind of get giddy? And that's what happened, you see. So we did and then he came around and I blew mine up a little bit more and I had a bottle. It was still working fine. And so we clung together. Mm -hmm. but first we started to blow up, he took turns and other one, it's useless, see. We just exhaust ourselves. Right. And then we just waited for something to happen. And then, oh, I don't know how, it was hours, hours. This happened early in the morning, it was the next night when they came. We went up all the 17 hours. And and uh, no, how were how were you rescued? A destroyer came mm -hmm. by us, and when you know all of these ships are looking big, they are, <laughs> they are looking big. And I was sure, and Willie said that we talked. Willie really felt a little better than too, and because he always said he said you were hurt, you know. I said get about it. But salt water stops you from bleeding too, you know. And uh, the ship came, and I said they're picking us up now. Now first wait, when we float, a plane came around and mm -hmm. I said, Willie, they're going to drop a raft. <laughs> and of course, he said, yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> and when he flew by, we had all sorts of names for the people. <laughs> <laughs> it's laughable now, but that's what you do, sure. see. A lot of things go through your mind. Whatever happened to your luggage back home, you know, be <laughs> worried about that, you'll take care of that. And, and uh, the destroyer came in so close and the, Water when it comes, it spills, and I'm trying to push it away. So I still had Willie with me too. He was grabbing onto me and go away. And then the ship must have stopped and it slowed down. It wasn't quite the draft anymore. And it threw 
and knit over the side. And we call it Jacob's ladder, I don't know what they call it here, mm -hmm. it looked like a large fishing net. You know? mm -hmm. Threw it over the side and, and I realized what they do. And uh, uh, a guy came down and like I tell the story, and I tell the story and I, I know it, I didn't know about football then, but I know now. And there was one in the LA team, Rosie Greer, you know, remember them, Rosie Greer? Mm -hmm. That was him. It wasn't him. No, but he looked when the, the, always when he come on the screen. I said, "This is the guy that picked us up." He was big. He just in white. He had his cap on, in blue jeans, and he came down. You know, he picked me up with one grab, and he went up to. I had me one, you know, and he went up, for, get up, hold me out, and then took me over the side, and I didn't see the floor. I passed out there. I didn't see, and he must have been quite hard. And, and I really later on. I found that's about four feet high when he just dropped and he was getting really, oh. somebody went to really out, see. And we were separated from then. We were, and when I came to I was in the sick bay. They had me all washed up. And my belongings, my billfold, everything was on the nightstand. And I was clean. And uh, where did you go from there? Did they? From there, they kept us aboard the ship. Uh -huh. And they took us to port in Oran, in uh -huh. North Africa. Uh -huh. And then I learned, we learned to, we thought we we knew we weren't the only one that already told us or something like that. There was another, they picked some up too, mm -hmm. and they took us to Oran. H how and many from your boat survived? Out of 50, crew of 50, one nineteen survived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we learned too that the captain was severely wounded, and mm -hmm. a few others were wounded too. Mm -hmm. Mine was just minor. And we're taken to Africa. And uh, they brought trucks. We were loaded up like you see them all herded on the back. No, not all. There were other people too with us. We were just uh, there were soldiers. And cut it off. So the American boat, they picked you up and they they took they, you they to Africa. They landed the port uh, uh -huh. and uh, somebody else took over and they took us by truck, mm -hmm. loaded us to the back by truck through the desert in the prisoner of war camp. And the prisoner of war camp was run by British, mm -hmm. the British soldiers there. And there were some Americans there too. And they were detailed because they fleeced us again, uh, and took stuff away from us, and we didn't have much. The belongings I had with the guy, it, it, took, it took anyway, not jewelry. I know we didn't have much of my billfold. I had all the pictures mm -hmm. went in the water. And I had a cigarette case I kept for a while, the watch I had too. Uh, but then it got rough and on the truck already when they took us to the desert, the heat, mm -hmm. and they were driving through swarms of uh, grasshoppers. Oh. Oh, they were swarms and they were hitting the truck and they, and they started to smell, hit you in the face. And they were not a grasshopper, they were about this size mm -hmm. when they fly. And got through, it was, oh, it was horrible. And we were all trying to duck, they were so close, we didn't know where to duck from. I um, mean, they loaded us and Usual thing, we checked in in the, took, in the camp, and we were, we learned then they called us super Nazis. We were super Nazis, mm -hmm. we called, see, because we formed a submarine as a special force. Mm -hmm. They had respect for us, in a way. And there were three to a compound. There was a, a gangway, there was just all wires, it was mm -hmm. all wires, a long gangway, and it like chicken stalls, see. Three two pound had a pup tin, three men to a deal, and a bucket. There was it, and a blanket to each. And we were put in there. Mm -hmm. How and long were you there? Uh, we were there about 17 days, 10 days, 17 days, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. And interrogation started there, mm -hmm. but it was minor, and immunization. Another story, laughable today. That's the things I remember, a lot of things I forget immunization. And they gave us shots. We had women's breasts, believe me, they were swollen up. And of course the doctors were Jewish and we know they had it in for us. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was horrible. But we had to have it. He said, you got to have it. And, and by golly, if not in the afternoon, lined us up and they gave us another one. Uh -huh. Right next to the one we already had. And we knew they were going to kill us. In the camp, it wasn't too bad. The British treated us fine. Uh, one incident, like the British, he came from, he was Scotty, 
But he said the, the V2s were coming to the bomb in England again, you know, in London. V2s, he was telling us about it. At night, he came around, he collected our shoes. We had to give up, no, not the shoes, we had to give up the shoelaces, the belts, or the suspenders that we had them. So, so we wouldn't get out the camp. Mm -hmm. But in the camp, you didn't have wires, you had wires on top. You couldn't stand upright. You always had to, with your head down, if mm -hmm. you want to move so you both sat down or caught on the, on the sand in the tent. At night it got cold, and the company we got with great big frogs came at night. They were looking for a warm place too. <laughs> and you could hear them when they come flopping in the sand. But that Scotsman I must remember, he said, why did you take us away? He gave us cigarettes to him. He complained about the food. He said, we eat the same thing as you do. He was a barber by trade. He was a reservist, the regular here. And he always, we had beards and hair. He wanted, he was a haircut and shaved mm -hmm. here. And uh, no, I said, we'll keep it. And we asked him why he, he took uh, the shoelaces uh, suspenders and matches, uh, matches too. We get them back in the morning, mm -hmm. eh? but uh, why do, he said, these Germans, he said, you can't trust them. He said, you give them a rubber band and a, and a box of matches, he said, they're going to build a message for He was laughing, but he meant it, yeah, that's uh, But in a way, but then we were taken uh, over to uh, Casablanca. Well, they sorted us out to Casablanca, and they flew us to Norfolk. Mm -hmm. And in Norfolk, to uh, what was it, Marine camp there, confined. Treat treatment was good, and then from there they took us to Washington. And it was hell. We we travelled in style. We were seven people, I know, and I had a limousine. One driver, two guards, and one prisoner. Just four people in one truck and had a convoy. And they had a big truck behind us, too. And what we learned later on, they had all the goodies in their food. And we camped out in a, with a parking place, you know, what they call the picnic places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they circled the trucks. And then people came and sat around, too, and they fed us. They really in style. But they want to know where our horns are. They said the Nazis, they're supposed to have horns. See? Kids were asking yeah. <laughs> and then it was confinement in Washington for interrogation. That was no fun there. Mm -hmm. How long? Isolated. How long? I, I, I can't remember how mm -hmm. long I was in that camp. It was at least a week, mm -hmm. if not more. Mm -hmm. It seemed a long time. Mm -hmm. And then I can't even can't remember uh, taken to a camp single again, uh, to a marine camp in Big Backs. And it was right next to a camp where they punished the soldiers. It was a, a boot camp, that's what it was. They, they kept us where these soldiers they trained there, you know, for overseas or sort of Marines. And the ones that didn't behave, they had the punishment, they had to dig holes till they couldn't look out with the shovel, see, and then they come out and fill them back in. And <laughs> we thought this was punishment. Mm -hmm. It was punishment. And they told us, if you misbehave, this is what you're going to do too. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the bags, I must say that it's, I'll never forget, as long as I live, it had two speakers in it. We heard what was going on and the music was playing. And playing the same tunes all day long. You are my sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot what they were. There's two country western songs. You are my sunshine. I forget the other one now. Oh, we had, they couldn't switch it off. It drove. They, I know they were drive us nuts day and night. Day and night, they drove us nuts. And then they transferred us to Camp McCain in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Masses over it. Mm -hmm. Prisoners of war. And we were separated, officers, men, and, uh, and the NCOs, or three different camps. Uh, there were camps, but they were divided into stockades or compounds. Camp McCain. And in those days, we didn't have to go to work. Officers and NCOs didn't have to go to work. Mm -hmm. So they stayed in camp, but the men went out to work and they went to carpools, washeteers, and whatever else. And then, well, then later on we transferred on and went to picking cotton too. <laughs> but we, and the when the war was over, or it was about over, they said, well, ranks doesn't matter anymore now, you're just Nazis right now. You know, you're prisoner of war, no more ranks and anything else. And we, 
objected to it. He said, no, you can't do that to us. He said, we can't. So they took us out there. Oh, they took the food away. That's right, all the privileges, mm -hmm. bread and water. And I say, okay, we, we, we stick it out. Now the officers didn't have to go, it was just for the NCOs, mm -hmm. and the men, just the same. But then they smuggled food in from each side and all that. But uh, they got wise to it too, because at night there was too much movement in the camp. We were eating at night, they were cooking, but they were, we cooked. I mean, it was no big meals, but soups and stuff like that, but it kept us going. When they found out, I said, well, that's not working, they took us to another camp. We had to walk. And this, they were a bit somewhat mean men. Uh, there was no marching, there was some they couldn't walk, and these guards had fixed by, and that's where they all had, and they were cutting them in the behinds and all that, so they all started to run, you know, scared. To, I don't think it was right. And then they said, bread and water, be no food, and then we said, well, these guys, they were hurt, you know, there were some sick, they need to be treated. I'm telling this, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, you agree to go to work or you just stay here and sleep. Now we slept under the barracks, there were barracks, but no, nothing in there. Just slept on the ground, it was cool under there. And we had running water taps and truck came and he threw bread over the fence and that's what we got. And then uh, we went on, we couldn't stick it, they wouldn't give us medical help for that. We said, it's, it needed. And at night, and somebody said, why do we do this? And uh, uh, kept on days, and we said, the ones are for protesting, or the ones are giving in, so separate, you know, we didn't ask for hands. This side, for and for against, and it kind of was tight, was swinging then too, so we gave in. And then we had to go pick up, to put, took us to a camp in tents. I think it was six men to a tent. We had to pick up, and I was fortunate to, uh, for in a way that I spoke some English, they looked for group leaders, the mm -hmm. small groups, big groups, and so on. And the farmers, there were detailed farmers come pick them up. They had to take them to the field, and they gave us a trial day, two trial, three trial days, pick cotton. Started with 50 pounds a day, and then with 75 pounds, and so on. And then they stayed at 100 pounds to hold the limit. And then the owner, the farmer, had to bring us back to camp. But I didn't have to pick. I was taking care of it, but I picked two uh, mm -hmm. to help out, because individually it was the gross, you had to have the gross weight, and no matter who picked what, but till the former was satisfied, then you could go. And yeah. how long did you do that? Oh, uh, two seasons. Two seasons. Yeah, till from 40, we went up there, 44, 45, 46, uh, yeah, Camp McCain, and the former had never sorted out the people amongst ourselves, which were good pickers, cotton pickers, and farmers were good to us too, fast, and I was fortunate enough that we had a Mr. Coleman with large farms there, and he said, he tell us by the fields, he said, no, these are not very good, he said, don't tell the guys, but I'll come at four o'clock, pick you up, you know. So we didn't have the numbers, he satisfied us, and then he wanted to know what we eat and grab. He furnished us cigarettes, he furnished us chocolates, candy, and he got salamis, from what he got caught, because when he went to the little, you know, in, 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 in Mississippi they have well, these little stores, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but he was bought by and everything there was, and cheese and ham and stuff, and the people didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. So the woman got around and he wasn't allowed to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So he sent his daughter out, out away from the town and buying the stuff, and still supplied it. And when she come with a pickup, he had a red pickup, the whole fort there. And she, we just knew we were, we knew where it was, and then we had to go and pick it up and take it in the in the fields and divide it up. We we weren't guarded unless there were patrols that were going around the different uh, farms, you know, mm -hmm. see what anything happened, everything was all right. We kept it from there. Of course, we started taking it into the camp too, and they found out, so then we were searched every time we come back. They put it in the water bottles and whatever else, the cigarettes and so on. Stopped all that too. But we managed. When were you out of the prison? When were you well, out of prison? And then when time came and the war was over, oh, when the war was over, we didn't go to work. No, that was when Oswald died, yeah. We didn't go to work that day when he died. And then they would take closing camps, and the, from there, when it was over, they took us to. Uh, 
New York. They yeah, took us to New York by mm -hmm. train. Mm -hmm. And they put us on a boat, these Liberty boats, and back home. And we got cards, we wrote cards uh, at Camp McCain, Mississippi, early address on them, and tell them we would be home two to three weeks to our folks back mm -hmm. home. But and on the on the ship we were groups too and I was called too. Well they knew then who could speak English, so we were responsible for a certain amount for a class so to speak and for the bumped and so on. We were responsible if anything was to be done or decided. We were just not that everybody would call, you know, they'd call just called us and we had to relay it. They treated us fairly, but the bunks were about, they were troop ships, where they mm -hmm. took the troops and, and uh, shipped us in it. But we had heavy seas when we went out there, heavy, heavy seas. And seasickness was, came into place. The food was good, but nobody ate it. And, uh, and nobody wanted to get up and clean it, because they were just seasick. Mm -hmm. And it was a mess. And then we were summoned one day. And we were informed by the Coast Guard or the, the armed guards who were on the ships that guarded us. They said, well, we need, we have a message here. And they told us, this ship is not going to Germany, you are taken to England. Mm -hmm. So we listened. He said, as far as we know, we, we, we're putting into Liverpool. That's all the orders he had. And you got to be put ashore. And basically, you're going to do another stint in England to clear up the mess you made over in England. Mm -hmm. That's the way he was put nicely. <laughs> <laughs> he said, now, how shall we do it? That we won't start any rumors because we, I don't want the riots on here. And then I could hear clinking, the, the guards had the armed, you know, the, the duty uniform on and the bottles were rattling and the armor and so on. Helmets they had on, we knew there was something going on, the, the people knew. And so well, the best thing was to go with PA and announce it to all of them. Some, most of them are here to know it instead of just going before we to start. And that's what they did. They know, of course, they were men. And there were people from the Africa Corps. They were already, sometime they were ready to go home. Mm -hmm. They didn't like that at all. And that's what happened to them. So we were un unloaded in England. Taken to Sheffield in a camp. We never saw anything camp. It was foggy as it could be. Mm -hmm. We heard about that English fog there. It was fog. Once you left your bags, you couldn't find another one. Can we time there? Yeah. yeah, I'm coming to the end. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then we were assigned to, again, groups. And we were loaded on a train. It was after a certain period. I don't remember the time. It was probably a week or two. Mm -hmm and we were taken to London. And on London at, uh, what is the big station, Water, Waterloo? Mm -hmm. I think it was Waterloo Station. Or oh, King's Cross. No, it wasn't King's Cross, it was another one. Waterloo, yeah. I think it was the Waterloo, yeah. the station. We were assigned and I was in charge of uh, so many people. And uh, it was 50 people. <laughs> And then we were taken from there, uh, different, no, to a main camp, to Shepherd's Bush. Shepherd's Bush was uh, the main camp, and taken there, it was the same group, we just spent the night there, and then they took us out. And we occupied, the the bags were used during the war by the air raid wardens. They were scattered over town, and the place we finished up in London was, say, East Bonnet finished up there, 50 people in these bags, and before us there was some Italian prisoners of war in there. Mm -hmm. And they were put us there, and from there we were detailed one guard, and took us to, to work the next day, they picked us up for work. We had our own cook for ourselves, we were self-supporting war, we in mm -hmm. the sergeant. Mm -hmm. And when we were introduced to him at the camp, he said, I got one wire around it, the stakes around the camp, he said, this is all I want to see, because there were houses back and front and on the side. And he said, but if I see anybody outside this fence, he said, we got rolls and rolls of barbed wire left from the war. He said, we don't want to mess up the neighborhood. <laughs> and we, we stuck there pretty good. And we were pretty free. After a while, they even let us go to church on Sundays mm -hmm. without a guard. The church didn't want any guards. No, they wanted, wanted you know, there were about 50 Christians going to church. <laughs> Even the cook went to 
the apologies to shoes and everything else. They want to get in touch with the public. We did at work. We meet people. <clears throat> the group we had work detail. We had we had a, an American, not American, a British. He was a, a what do they call the people that uh, they don't go to war. Conscientious, conscientious objector. objector. So I couldn't remember conscientious objector. He spoke three languages, or his own in French and German. Mm -hmm. He was interpreter of Shell Oil Company. He had to go at the presence of war. It was a waste of personnel. That's why he felt, you know. I said, well, that's what I've been doing all along. You know, it won't be over anyway. So, oh, his duty. That was his duty. Still, it was more punishment for him than anything mm -hmm. else. But he was a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And from there, they, they eased to restrictions. They sent us to another camp, and they closed it. And it was kind of a mansion in in the woods, in a park. And we were self-supporting again. We had one sergeant, but we were allowed out. We had no fence. Mm -hmm. We could go out uh, uh, Saturdays from noon till dark, Sundays from noon till dark, mm -hmm. within a radius of five miles. So they eased it up quite a bit. And then they started sending people home once mm -hmm. after a while. And uh, But we asked them to send us to tell us what they find when they get home, what it's like at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't hear, nobody heard from anybody. We found later on they haven't heard in Germany either. They never got home from these people. They never got home. We heard rumors that some were taken to France as they come off the boat, mm -hmm. and some were shipped to Russia too. And they were missing. So the uh, way we had the life, and, the, and you know, I was a group leader then, and I didn't like it anymore. Uh, I wanted a little uh, group, we said, you know, platoon, where you get touched with people to the nurses I hurt, and I found a, a nursing man with three people, and I went, I gave up to being group leader and just worked in a nursery. That's what we did, uh, planting. What nursery work is, you know? The, they took us there by truck and, and that would go back and forth and all that. And uh, then people were going home and something came around and the boss there called me in one day. He said, Werner, how would you like to stay here? You know, when we told him what it was at home. Then we got mail from home, you know. And we asked about those people we hadn't heard. And my father went to find out they hadn't heard. And he said, if you have choice to stay there, for a while, till things get better, why don't you stay? As long as you have a roof over your head, they treat you right, give you some leave, stay. Mm -hmm. And then Irving and I, we stayed there in Heights. And because this, this particular far, uh, nursing man, he had two people who worked for him. And he, uh, we worked hard, we behaved ourselves, he had no sweat. And it even came to a point where I never drove a car, I drove a, tract, drove a tractor once on the farm. When they left the farm, was left when we got all of these and raced around. <laughs> and <clears throat> in the nursery, same with a tractor or a little van, whatever, motorized, we're trying to get hold of it and so on. But anyway, I finished up for that man. I drove the car. He took me to get a driver's license as a POW mm -hmm. and did deliveries. It was against some of the people who didn't like it. He had workers there, they were in the British Army and all that, and they were looking for something like that too. Uh, and they couldn't figure out why this crap getting all these jobs. You know, it was favoritism. He stuck his neck out, but he got his money's worth. And uh, a little truck, deliveries, he got some business from people to florists, the markets. He, they, during the war, he had to grow vegetables, what was necessary, but after the, the were eating. Rose growers and stuff like that, and tulips, and the flowers. That was their business, and they, after the war, they turned back into that, see. You know, making these deliveries with POW on my pants and my jacket. It, it was a novelty, and we made friends. We'd come there, they cup of coffee, the rainers. We kept in touch with people for a long time. They came to the wedding, you know, we were mad. It's a for supply to flowers. I met Joan. Mm -hmm. My wife over there, mm -hmm. or the mother first, mm -hmm. 
and my wife, and that's how we finished up. And then, were you? I, I was, I said, I was still a prisoner of war, uh -huh. but uh, it was dissolved again, and I was left there, providing the man who served that be, he had to provide cover for us, and we had a place to stay, mm -hmm. and all that, you know, and we had to report it once a month, well, at first once a week to the police, and then once a month go to the police station and report. And I could move around in, because didn't wear POW clothes, but I uh, did for some, just for the kicks of it. And, but uh, Covent Garden Market, which is a big market, I then drove a truck at night, or during the day, and then at night. And I kept this up for a long time, making extra money even when I, I had to commit myself for two years to this nursing man. Mm -hmm. Keep me, he was my sponsor. And after that, uh, I went, I did some painting on the side for people I knew on the nursery, made a little extra money, and all of them. We got married in 1947, mm -hmm. December 20th. Yeah, I had to, we had to because I got a few days off from Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we married. And then did you did you stay in? Well, we I didn't marry. Then uh, we we left, and then and I moved in with her before we got married with her parents. So. And uh, that 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 nursing man, he knew I wasn't quite happy or living with the in-laws and stuff. Not that I had any against the in-laws. It just wasn't practical in a sense with the parents that were the way then. And, and we lived in another house, and we were supposed to be no. Renters or have other people living there is against the law and so on. Mm -hmm. That man bought a house, a, a row house. I mean, in rows they had with an England, and it has two bedrooms, little bedrooms, living room, kitchen, and out, outhouse in the back of the yard. Mm -hmm. And he bought it. He said, I'll give you three months free, you pay rent, three months free, you fix it up the way you like it. He even furnished the materials. In which we did, and we moved there. Oh, well, we had there. Uh, uh, we lived there two years. You know, and my daughter was born there in that house. Mm -hmm. And then you came to America. Uh, we came to America later on. Uh -huh. the, we stayed there, and I had a relative here. We got in touch with them, and they came to the christening of our baby. Mm -hmm over there and made it not so special but as a first trip back after the war to see my family but they stopped over in England and there was talk that I could do better mm -hmm. over in America and all it, it sounded good but they were they described it all and well we did but we had to wait see we couldn't go on the quota yeah two minutes <laughs> two years <laughs> two years yeah, we had to wait two years before we were allowed to come here. Mm -hmm. And today they're walking across the border. <laughs> what we had to fill in, the forms we had to fill in, mm -hmm. paperwork and all that. We landed in New York with $12. We left in snow and ice when we left in, in, in England, in London. We flew from London to Love Field. We got to Love Field, it was 89 degrees when we got <laughs> I had a hat and a long coat. So yeah. We thought we were going to die. We thought we were going to die. And it wasn't like here we had to get off the plane and walk to the terminal there till we met my, my aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. And they had an apartment, that's how we stayed here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a business and I worked for him for, for a little while, but uh, I didn't care for it too much. Mm -hmm. Or it was too technical, I couldn't. And, so we just branched out for ourselves. Okay, so now looking back, was there anything that was memorable to you or made an impact on you or any special story that... Well, it's just, when you're there talking about being in the water there, floating, mm -hmm. things come to your mind. Uh, I've been asked, he said, did you pray? Mm -hmm. You know, or what was your thinking? Were you worried? Or so, it's funny things come to your mind. I was more worried about a suitcase I bought from a prostitute. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, we were friends. It wasn't just that. We were friends, uh -huh. you know. In in 
and my mother had the case, left the home and she never see that again. See? Right. But it was at the base, see, that she wouldn't get that suitcase. It worried me about the suitcase. Worried about the suitcase while yeah. you were in the water? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, don't get me wrong. We did go and this was way of life. But mm -hmm. we went to bottles, but to eat, you know, they had everything. Entertainment, it wasn't that you go up there. No, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You just all take. That's I worried about that, mm -hmm. or it came to my mind. Right. Yeah, I worried about my folks, how they might be. But pray, I don't remember, no. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a dirty trick what they did to us. Mm -hmm. That's the way I looked at it. Right. To me, especially, I was on being on that boat, which I didn't call my boat. The 571 was my boat. <laughs> right. So, what else is memorable about it? Oh, gosh. Have you been back to Germany? Since? Yes, I go regular. You, you and regularly? I meet, uh, we, uh, a few years ago we had reunions, but the group's getting smaller and smaller, older mm -hmm. too. And I went back this year, took mm -hmm. my younger daughter, my older daughter with me, my younger daughter with me. She wanted to know where it was. We went to the memorial mm -hmm. and uh, visited with friends. And my captain right now, he's very sick. We weren't allowed to see him, mm -hmm. so we couldn't. And uh, this is memorable too, going back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I keep up with the people. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I had a phone call last night. I won't, won't know how I'm doing, what I'm doing. <laughs> so, but it all fades away. I, I really don't know how to answer all this. Ask me some questions and I will. Well, Mr. Kruger, I'd just like to thank you for sharing your stories from your experiences. You're quite welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I wish we could more in it now. I remember a few other things <laughs> that come to my mind. That's okay. We're. Uh, I would like to see some of your medals and your pictures. You're so we're gonna welcome. we're gonna look at those right now. Uh, okay. I have some pictures, and that's why I want you to come here. Okay. <laughs> or I thought it'd be interesting. Yes. For you, thank so. you very much. Okay, tell us about the flags. The flag, this is the flag from First World War. It's the, uh, the Navy of the Kaiser, German Kaiser, 1418. Mm -hmm. And this is the present German flag. We have actually a Navy flag. I don't have one. I try hard to get one, but they're not on the market. They're uh, an item which you don't display. And if you have one, more or less it's just for research or uh, history mm -hmm. works they have mm -hmm. I, I'm time I'm looking for one mm -hmm. again, that's about it about it this these are the medals I was given there or awarded the submarine badge uh, Iron Cross second class Iron Cross first class this is mine in uniform dress uniform and this how we looked in on duty and these are pictures of submarines just at random. This sailing ship here, uh, it's not the same one I was into. I've, I belong to the Hitler Youth Navy part of it way back. That's what got me going mm -hmm. in the Navy when Hitler came to power. In one summer camp, an uh, Argentinian ship came in and we were so taken up with it. Uh, then they had a lot of it. Fifty people could go and see it go on the ship and have a meal with them and I was one of them mm -hmm. and from then on I wanted to go to Argentina that was part of the Navy mm -hmm. and my dream was being a radio operator or in, in that line after you serve four years and then you resign for 12 years mm -hmm. and this was my point but the 12th year they train you for whatever you want to be or you want to do mm -hmm. if an engineer naturally they will do something or and I wanted to be in communications on the German embassy in Argentina. That was what I wanted to do after the war, mm -hmm. but or after my my mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. And these sailors there, they let us climb up. They weren't weak. They were in harbor. You know, these sailors were all right. But we sat on their benches, ate with them, and all. We so thrilled. That's where I wanted to go. So this this was something I never forget mm -hmm. as a kid. Mm -hmm. When they came in the bay, we were in the camp high up, 
And when they came into the bay, the sails not all full, and all these sailors were up there lined up and waving their hats to, towards us. Or we thought they were waving to us. But the memorial was right down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were waving to them. Yeah. I made this spare time on the submarine. We all had a little hobby. That was the earlier part of the submarines. Like when we traveled from, from the base across the Atlantic, it took some time. Mm -hmm. And everybody had something to do. This is copper, um, uh, brass. And with files and sandpaper and everything else, it's done by hand. Everybody had something to do, I had a hobby. I made that. This is Bakelite, we call it, from the engineers to the background. Now this is what our boat looked like here, see, in, in the water. This is not our boat, but the same class boat. Right. And, right. Yeah. This is the quest of my hometown here. <laughs>